Never in the history of making videos on this channel have I witnessed such a frenetic news cycle as the one that we experience today. And what a privileged position to be in here in the first world where the lights are still on, where we can watch the world burn from the comfort of our living room. Make sure you don't get soft and make sure you don't take anything for granted because we could be on the other end of the computer any moment. Now, this is your World War III update, and I'm going to be first giving you the abridged version of all the salient points of the information of today, things you are absolutely not going to hear anywhere else, and analysis that I hope is novel enough to be worthwhile of a listen. And then we're going to go into the details for people who got better things to do, you can bounce. But let me just break it down in simple terms. Here's what's going on. Israel wanted to start a war with Iran. So here's what's happening. Israel decided to target Hamas's chief negotiator, Haniyeh, killed him in Tehran when they could have taken him out anywhere else. Okay, this guy's been bouncing around the Middle East since October 7th, staying only miles from U.S. military bases on multiple occasions. They could have taken him out anywhere. The reason why they took him out while he was staying in Tehran, at a funeral no less, is due to the fact, not at a funeral, excuse me, uh, at an inauguration ceremony for the new president, that was for the purpose. That was for the purpose of provoking an attack or retaliatory strike from the Iranians because what they need right now more than anything to get an even bigger blank check and to bring the United States of America into a massive war in the Middle East they need to see buildings burning in Tel Aviv. And that's exactly what they're now likely going to get. The question is, when is Iran going to do it? And does Iran actually know about this plan? I presume they do, because anybody with a modicum of analytical capability can understand that if Israel just wanted to take this guy out, they could have did it long ago anywhere else. The fact that they went into Tehran okay, into the belly of the beast, so to speak, from our point of view, tells you that uh, they were sending a message, and not only that, that this was a provocation. They want Iran to do a strike. Anybody can figure that out. It's obvious, okay, just that those simple points alone should be enough to substantiate the conclusion that indeed Israel wants Iran to attack them. Now, the question is, what's this attack going to look like? Right now, there's a lot of psychological warfare going on in Iran, and I got like 30 or 40 tabs open here, guys. I've never had this many tabs open ever in the history of this channel. I don't even know where to start this video. I mean, we could break down all the minutia of what's going on, but it's such a developing fluid situation in the Middle East. By the time this video is released, who knows what's going to happen. There's a lot of hype right now about Iran's counterattack. Iran has said, indeed, that they are going to counterattack, uh, retaliate, I should say. And they've made that very evident at the UN, okay? And there's compelling evidence to suggest that it's going to be big, much bigger than what we've seen in April. And it's not going to be broadcast in advance so that the U.S. and Israel can move its guys out of there, whatever. So we know that it's coming, we just don't know when, okay? So we're going to try to figure that out today. We're going to just look at all the data, we're going to look at everything going on in the world at once and try to figure it out. And if you didn't know, the markets were crashed today big time. I'm looking at Amazon here, 11.83% down in one day. I don't know if that was, if these are the final numbers. I don't think they were. I think this was at the bottom of the day when the Dow was down like 900 points. I think it closed down 600 points. But this is why the insiders have been selling lately. We've been warning you. I mean, Jeff Bezos, Imagine, remember how much stock Jeff Bezos sold in the last year? What is it, like $20 billion worth of stock? There's your answer, okay? We've been telling you this for the longest time. Gold is holding around the $2,500 range, which is absolutely insane and unprecedented. Now, here's what's going on. 
Israel needs their blank check. They already pretty much got it. The U.S. is sending another, I believe it's Carrier Strike Group 3, is it the Abraham Lincoln? That's what's going to the Middle East now. They're saying it's going there to replace the Theodore Roosevelt. However, in the switchover, that's when you potentially have things flaring up. So they say that we're going there to replace this, but then for a while, for a brief window, you have both of them operating at the same time, maybe weeks for all we know. So this is a lot of military power. Of course, ships have a limited amount of missiles on them. So if they are preparing to engage in a full-on war with Iran, Yemen, Iraqi militias, Lebanon, then they're likely not going to have enough troops there, but this could just be a mission creep situation. Let's talk about the details of what is going on because we need some way to try to frame today's video or else we're just going to get lost in the weeds. According to Iranian state television, they're saying that in the coming hours, the world is going to witness very important developments. I think at this point in time, it's difficult to say whether or not this is psychological warfare, just to put the Israelis on edge. Of course, this plays into Netanyahu's plans very well, because the best way to get protesters off the streets is to have an external threat, okay? So we've seen this time and time again, when any sort of uh, dictator or any government is at risk from its own population, they find an external enemy, a scapegoat to get everybody scared and into the bunker. And that is literally what is going on in Israel today. Everybody is basically in the bunker. A lot of flights have been canceled to Israel. A lot of flights have been canceled to Iran. Now Khamenei, the uh, supreme leader, the Ayatollah of Iran, has pinned a tweet. And the fact that this guy uses X is strange. I don't know if I'm assuming that he's not the one doing this, that it's not, he's not the one in possession of the phone, because of course Nasrallah today warned about uh, having telephones, because of course you could triangulate people's locations. Anyways, he's saying that the Zionism regime is gone. Now this was actually a tweet from October 3rd, just four days before October 7th, but he repinned the tweet. And Basically, all sources are indicating that whatever Iran is planning, it's going to be much different from what we've seen in April, where it was a very measured and intentionally non-escalatory response. This is going to be big, or at least that's what they're hyping it up as. For all we know, this is all hype to get the U.S. military into the region, okay? Israel needs their blank check. Of course, if you have buildings on fire in Tel Aviv, can you imagine the double standard and the pearl clutching when it's on that side of the railroad tracks, right? Imagine how it's going to be portrayed. The horror, the agony. We have no choice now. We have to attack Iran's nuclear power plants. That's what this is all about. This is why I told you back in January when nobody was talking about a pending war with Iran, certainly not in the timeline that I proposed, that they're going to go to war with Iran. They set it all up last year with House Resolution 559. Now they're trying to plow more bills through the Senate, of course, initiated by Lindsey Graham. I can't even stand saying the guy's name. And that is exactly what is going to happen. They're going to give justification to go after Iran's nuclear power plants. And if the attack is so bad that you have a lot of civilian casualties, that may even be their ticket to using the nuclear weapons that they're going to need to penetrate deep into the Iranian bunkers, okay? So they're getting it all set up. We are going to war with Iran before the election. I said it on January 30th, I said it in April, and I'm saying it now. It's going to happen. Everything points towards that. There's a lot of wild cards though, there was a Russian shipment today on a military plane and people are suspecting that it could potentially possess some Wunderwaffe of some sort, be it an S-400, obviously one of them is not going to be able to be sufficient, but if they have the means to defend their nuclear facilities, of course that could be the arrangement. Or could it be a nuclear weapon? At this point, 
anything is possible, okay? This is the exact same relationship that Putin had with Syria. And it was brought to my attention that Putin had met with uh, the president of Syria, Assad, a week ago in Moscow. And the central points of that discussion were that the Middle East, that a war was about to start, okay, in the Middle East, and that Russia had Syria's back when it starts. Well, here we go, okay? So the Russians obviously have intelligence on what NATO and Israel's plans are going to be, and they're passing that on probably to the Iranians and the Syrians. So while the Israelis are leveraging uh, the very sophisticated ISR apparatus of the Americans, the Iranians perhaps now are getting far more information than Russia uh, than they were at one time. Because of course now, I just want to make sure my microphone is on properly here. Are we on? Are we good? Yeah, we're good. Sometimes I forget to turn it on. I got to re-record the whole thing. Um, now, of course, the Russians and Iranians have this military partnership. So they're sharing more information. Okay, so where were we? In the coming hours, the world will witness very important developments. There was a video that was put out by an Iranian commentator. And uh, they were saying that in the next, I think, few hours, this is when they're going to start feeling the heat. Now, this could just be psychological warfare. This could just put everybody there on edge in an attempt to throttle Israel's economy even more keep their population scared, but who does that really play into? That plays into the hands of Netanyahu. So uh, Iran is, has a very difficult task ahead if they do want to retaliate, because of course they have to do something or else they look weak. If they do something, they probably have to do it soon while it's still fresh in the minds of the international community, and there, at least in the minds of some countries, is justification for a retaliatory response, of course, on the heels of presenting it uh, to the UN, then if they wait too long, of course, the military buildup in the Middle East is going to reach a point where the retaliation to the retaliation is going to be too overwhelming. And if they wait too long, even after that, when everybody's gotten complacent and the US warships have uh, pulled back, then they run the risk of just looking like the aggressors. So they, they're tasked with a very uh, difficult predicament. I think right now they're resigned to the fact that the West and Israel clearly want a war. Because again, going back to my initial point, if they did not want a war, if we didn't want a war, we would have not advised Israel to target Hanie on Iranian territory. Now, people are trying to say, oh yeah, the Biden administration would never approve that. Well, the Iranian foreign minister is saying the opposite. He is saying, in fact, that Biden knew about this beforehand. And let's not forget that just a few days before this, Netanyahu got the green light to go to war with Lebanon, unofficially, of course, in the form of 58 standing ovations in one of the most, uh, I'm not even going to get into it. I was going to be very critical of that, but let's just, let's just stick to the facts for now. Uh, and so we know that uh, clearly there was a green light there. Iran knows that this is an implacable situation that cannot be resolved through peace talks. They've made that abundantly clear now in terms of uh, their, their statements that they've made, and it's on. So they're saying that their response is going to be decisive and unforgettable. The Iranian parliamentary speaker is saying that the act will not go unanswered. And the Iran foreign ministry is saying that I invite everybody to leave Israel. Everybody. Hmm. Interesting. So they want to instill fear in the population. But again, that plays into the hands of the Israelis. So U.S. sources are indicating that Hezbollah and Iran are planning to launch thousands of missiles in an assault expected to last several days. So we've seen the first time with the telegraph response. The Iranians have, <laughs> the quote from the commander of the military is like, we have, you know, missiles like we have cigarettes. We don't have enough places to store them. That's why they're building these massive underground bunkers. The question is, do they have the capability to put nuclear weapons on these uh, war on these missile deployment systems 
do they have the nuclear weapons themselves. Regardless, they have an endless amount of these missile systems of all shapes and sizes, hypersonic, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, you name it, they have it. And they're indicating that it's going to be a, a combined response from Yemen, who's been incredibly silent lately. If you haven't noticed, they've been very quiet. They were attacking ships left and right for the longest time. It appears as though they are stockpiling, getting ready to do a major attack, a coordinated attack with the axis of resistance as they refer to themselves. And Iran knows that if they don't hit Israel hard, then they're no longer going to have deterrence. And they're basically saying, you can come in, you can kill our nuclear scientists again, you can put Stuxnet viruses on our computers, you can target our nuclear facilities and our missile defense, you can do whatever you want and we're not gonna do anything substantial about it. So I think now that the problem is though, if they do go all out, Okay, if they don't do this in a measured way, and even if they do do it in a measured way, even if they just target military bases, even if they just do strategic strikes that don't play into the optics that the Israelis want, who's to say that maybe the guy pressing the missile defense iron dome button or the arrow button at the time doesn't just accidentally look the other way and let one through? Or... For all we know, and I'm just putting this out there, false flag events do happen. So Iran is in a difficult spot because clearly this time Israel wants a war. They want a response. They need it. Okay, and this is, you know, absent what's happening with Hezbollah in Lebanon. They're getting ready to do a counterattack as well. So this is all going to be coordinated. They're moving equipment, large-scale military movements, transportation of heavy military equipment across Iran. Right now, there is a ban on uh, uploading video content. Uh, so that's how you know it's getting serious. You can no longer, uh, in Israel as well, they are requesting. It starts off with a request, and then, of course, it turns into martial law. <clears throat> you can no longer upload video of militaristic Maneuvers, the same thing that happened in Poland recently. Electronic warfare and air defense systems are being observed in numerous Iranian provinces, and they're also installing these um, air defense systems in Tehran. This was an image that was sent to me by somebody who is in Iran. So they're getting ready to be attacked. Now, there was a Russian plane. Let me see if I have the flight radar record. There was a Russian military plane, here it is, that uh, went to Tehran. An Aleutian 76TD from Galex Airlines. This charter company is known for weapons transfers. Now, Obviously, Russia and Iran have a railway connection, okay? So they can ship whatever they need to ship by rail. The fact that they're sending these military planes means they're preparing for something imminent. The question is what? Or is this just an empty plane? Is this just a head fake from the Russians and the Iranians, making it look as though the Russians are extending the nuclear umbrella over Iran. There's a lot of what ifs right now. For starters, we've been hearing for years that Iran is but a couple weeks away from nuclear weapons. For all we know, there's maybe just a few components that they need in order to finish. And, you know, this is not to say that Moscow doesn't stand to benefit from Israel and Iran engaging in a nuclear war. I mean, after all, they have a lot of oil, they have all the resources that would potentially send Europe crawling back to them, uh, especially, of course, if uh, there's a wedge driven between NATO and the United States, which is another story, but that's something that's a work in process as well, attempting to undermine that relationship. I mean, NATO is arguably doing that to themselves, right? So something was on this plane, and this is the wild card that we really need to think about. How is Russia playing into this? Not just Russia, how are North Korea playing into this? And China, all of which who have vested interests in maintaining the Ayatollah and the theocratic regime in uh, Iran, who are of course militarily allied 
with all of the aforementioned countries. North Korea today said we will always respond decisively to any threat to our ally Iran. We warn the mercenary of global imperialism, namely Israel, not to make mistakes. And, uh, you know, North Korea is not one to sugarcoat and use euphemisms in their relationship with Israel like the Russians tend to do. Uh, North Korea just tells it like it is. They don't care. They openly criticize Israel, which is something not even Russia does. In fact, Dmitry Medvedev came out the other day and he said that he thinks the only pathway to peace in the region is through a war, a major war. Now, obviously Medvedev, the incorrigible one, is incredibly, always says inflammatory things, but uh, what was interesting about this is he put the blame square on the United States. There was no mention of Israel, in fact, and a lot of Russia's criticisms of Israel are very softball. Uh, you know, they, they follow the kind of line with the UN, they abstain from voting typically, and occasionally I think they might vote in support of an investigation of genocide or something, but they never do anything too standoffish. Obviously, you know, right now uh, they, they, they have a huge diaspora of Russian Jews who live there and uh, Jewish people who live in Russia. So it's a complicated situation. But it's interesting that uh, the only people who really don't give a shit at all <laughs> are, are just basically saying it how it is, are the North Koreans, that they're willing to essentially give <clears throat> Tehran nuclear weapons. And you know they would. It's a matter of whether or not Iran wants to accept them. Okay? So the North Koreans need the Iranian oil, as do the Chinese. But Iran knows that as soon as it gets those nuclear weapons, or if it doesn't get a sufficient amount with the sufficient deployment systems, then it won't be a deterrent. It will, in fact, encourage a preemptive strike by Israel. And the way that Israel is posturing right now is that it almost looks as though they are preparing for a preemptive strike. So we are on a razor's edge here. For all the nothing ever happens crowd, <laughs> You know, I, I mean, it, it, it's such a privileged position to be in, isn't it? To literally see this coming from miles away and be completely oblivious to it because it's an inconvenience to you. And you know, for whatever reason, some people just are, uh, I don't know what the word is, just obstinate. They, they just don't, they're incredulous. You know, they're, they're never going to, you can literally show them something and not until it comes on the mainstream media are they going to get freaked out about it. Those same people who are quick to come on here and tell us how crazy we are because we see the world as it truly is, these are going to be the worst kind of people in a shit hits the fan situation. The absolute worst because they're going to be the ones who are following orders. Okay? Remember that. The ones who are just following orders. Iran has threatened military bases in the region, U.S. military bases. You remember going back to around October and, you know, a, a few U.S. military bases were getting hit by these Iraqi paramilitary groups. And everybody was like, including myself, we were like, well, this is what they want. They want these bases to be attacked. And I believe it was, there, I had several guests on the channel basically say, yes, these troops are being kept there as bait. Okay, well, they might just get it now because the Iranian army commander has said, if the United States intervenes, which of course they're going to intervene, this time we will target all its military bases and interests in the region. Does the United States have military bases and interests in the region? There's Iran, okay. Oh, we have the Abraham Lincoln Strike Carrier Group. We have uh, another group coming into the situation. That one is the Theodore Roosevelt and its strike group. Is it the Lincoln that's heading there? Or I think it's the Lincoln that's heading there. And this is a very up-to-date map. And it's the Theodore Roosevelt who is currently off the Strait of Hormuz. But they're leaving the Persian Gulf because they're worried that Iran is going to counter and clearly they would be dead in range. I mean, that would be like shooting fish in a barrel. 
and you know Iran can basically track everything that goes on in this region with its sophisticated ISR technology, some of which they've stolen from the Americans whose drones they've hacked many years ago. So this is what we got going on. We got a huge uh, allotment of military outposts in the Middle East. And in terms of a more detailed breakdown of what's going on here, so Theodore Roosevelt is currently there in this region here. We have Fifth Fleet destroyers in blue. In green, we have uh, U.S. Coast Guard cutters. We have other Navy warships as well in the region. And uh, we also, of course, have the amphibious strike group, the WASP, which is off the, course, off the coast of the Mediterranean, well outside of range of Lebanon. So they're trying to stay out of missile range. And Cyprus and Greece in this region have closed down their airspace for tonight on all the hype of a retaliatory strike, but we don't really know if that's going to happen. In terms of what's happening on flight radar, it doesn't seem to suggest that there's been any closure of airspace around Iran. However, uh, during the counterstrike of Iran back in April, uh, I don't think that the airspace was entirely closed during that period as well. So we still have a lot of traffic moving across Iran and Iraq. I would presume that if an attack was imminent, as in the next few hours, we wouldn't be seeing this. But then again, you just never know. Because of course, right now, the element of surprise is everything, but there is indeed a psychological operation to keep everybody on edge, it would appear. This is a video, all Iranian channels, I was informed, and this could be somewhat exaggerated or fake news, but started broadcasting this simultaneously. And apparently, I won't play it, but it's the anthem of the Iran-Iraq war. So they're definitely ramping up the propaganda. In a lot of ways, Iran and the Iranian government would benefit from a war themselves because, let's face it, you know, there's, there's division everywhere. Not a lot of uh, voters came out to vote in the last Iranian election. A lot of people are losing faith in the theocratic regime that they have there and the whole arrangement that they have where they don't feel the president has a lot of power. So Iran almost needs an external enemy itself. So in terms of who benefits from all the chaos, it's not just the Mossad and Israel who benefit, and the CIA and the United States, of course, it's also the Iranian government, okay? So it's something to keep in mind. <clears throat> right now, the US has B-2 spirit bombers, nuclear capable, arriving in Qatar. They also have uh, another strike carrier group that we've talked about heading there. France and numerous other European countries, as well as many other countries around the world, are asking their citizens to leave Iran. Hezbollah is moving equipment into the bunkers, moving staff and equipment, especially out of Beirut, in fear of an Israeli strike. Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, has stated... The war with Israel has entered a new phase. The leader of Hezbollah has emphasized. Now, this guy talks a lot. And I just stopped listening to him because, quite frankly, he just talks a lot. And nothing really that significant ever happens, okay? But I think this is an important statement that we've entered a new phase with respect to all of this. I think right now, or for the longest time, that axis of resistance or axis of evil, whatever you want to refer to them as, depending on what side you're on, they've been hoping that they can try to attrit the Israelis because they know Israel's small. They only have so many troops, which is why they're having to now conscript the ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish seminary students. And they know that if they can wait it out, there's a good chance that collectively the 100 million plus people who are against uh, the state of Israel and what they're doing with the Gaza Strip, that they could wait them out, right? But now it's getting to the point where what Israel is trying to do is systematically target their upper 
echelons so to create power vacuums and create infighting because every time you do that uh, there's people you know people get accustomed to taking orders from somebody and when there's a movement or a successor uh, that's when potential uh, conflicts of interest arise and then of course uh, all your diplomatic efforts uh, between all these various groups starts to break down so you're left with a choice either you just get slowly uh, taken down one by one or you just go all in and we're at a point right now where that entire axis is saying we're going all in it is all out war iran is blaming the usa again the israeli the iranian intelligence minister said that the u.s gave israel the green light to eliminate the hamas leader in tehran and that U.S.-Israel coordination is likely closer than what some, some news reports suggest. I mean, this should be obvious by now. Like, you got Biden with this whole report that, oh, we're, we're taking a tough stance on Netanyahu and, uh, you know, this, this, this masquerade of hand-wringing that we currently have where Biden is saying, well, we're going to support you this time, but if you do something bad again... We're not going to support you. That, that's basically what, or, or the United States is not going to come to your aid. Well, I mean, you're saying this as they just did that, as you claim to not have been informed about it. And now you're sending all of this military equipment there. So that's only going to incentivize them to do it again and again and again and again. So the Iranians are starting to say, yeah, this is bullshit. I mean, they've known about it for the longest time, but it's become abundantly clear that this whole smoke show about you know, Kamala and Biden in some way being uh, less in bed with the Israelis than Trump is just nonsense. They're all on the same team, essentially, right? So Iran has now rejected mediation outright. So this is different because usually the Russians and the Iranians say what you want. I follow these issues closely. These are not irrational actors in the diplomatic space, okay? They're willing to have negotiations. The Iranians wanted the nuclear deal and that whole JCPOA. They, they want to uh, avoid war. But of course, we don't. And that's just, that's just the reality. If you, don't, if you think the otherwise, you're brainwashed, straight up and down. This is the military-industrial complex. I'm not saying they're good. I'm not saying Maduro's good or Putin's good or Xi Jinping are good you know, choose your evil, but we're not good either. It's just, we're all human beings. It's a, a big game theory that's currently unfolding. And, uh, you know, some people are more evil than others, put it that way. And I think once you get to a certain spot at the top, it's, uh, it's like psychopathy is something that you increasingly need to do more and more heinous acts in order to get the same thrill. At least that's how it is with most psychopaths. So I think these people, when they get in these positions of power where they have too much power, they just start messing with people. Okay, but we won't get into that. So we have uh, airlines, as I've said, postponing flights to Iran. Uh, we have right now the heavy targeting of Lebanese forces, especially on the border with Syria. So they're trying to intercept these convoys of troops that are coming in from Syria to Lebanon in an attempt to interdict the, the, the progress of the resistance getting mobilized. But the entire region is mobilizing for war, okay? An Iraqi channel is claiming that Harakat Hezbollah al-Najaba, an Iranian-backed paramilitary force under the 13th Brigade of the Popular Mobilization Forces has ordered a general mobilization of its forces. And all of these various uh, factions and, and, and sects, they're all starting to mobilize for a major war, okay? So that's what's going down. That is what's going down. Jordan is obviously going to jump into the fray as well, and they too run the risk of being targeted by Iran, as do a lot of the states uh, that uh, are playing host to American military bases. And I expect that Yemen is going to unleash, uh, especially if the Saudis get involved. So it's just a very complicated uh, state of affairs. The Israelis are saying, hey, we don't need your troops. Sure you don't. <laughs> you need the troops, the American troops, if you're going to fight a conventional war. You can't tell me that it took you eight months 
to neutralize, and you really haven't even done that yet, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, like the easiest possible situation, uh, a, a little strip of land that is monitored with the most advanced intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance on earth, with the most advanced weapon systems on earth. Like you could not ask for a more one-sided, easier conflict. And they are still dealing with that. And that is literally right within an enclave on in their country. And then you got the Americans in the Mediterranean helping them out. So, I mean, to, to think, the hubris to think that you're going to be able to replicate that in Lebanon without the help of the United States military, and even with the U.S. military, I mean, may, the U.S. is not what it was in Iraq. In fact, we got, what, like $25 trillion more debt than we did at that point in time. We have, you have Iran, which is over a thousand miles away from Israel. You need refueling, you need uh, the long-range aircraft, and you're basically limited to, you're not going to do any kind of ground offensive there. And it's this treacherous mountainous region all throughout that region, desert. So what are you going to do? You, there's nothing you can do. All you can do is use nuclear weapons or neutron bombs or EMPs. And maybe that's what they're going to do because that's all you can really do. The refueling tankers are already en route to the region. They're removing chemicals like ammonia from the ports, they being the Israelis. They're uh, handing out emergency satellite phones to Knesset members. They're not ruling out preemptive strikes. And this is something to keep in mind, is that they are even talking about doing preemptive strikes. They're like, okay, so if Iran is saying that they're going to respond and hit us, maybe we should just hit them first. So maybe what we're seeing in Israel is actually a mobilization to go on the offensive and take the initiative. Israel is also going to be blocking media when the shooting starts. According to the mayor of Haifa, he told Channel 12 Hebrew that if the city is attacked, photography with personal phones will be prohibitive. And we're also seeing that in Iran as well, where they're asking citizens not to take pictures of military equipment on roads. Now, if it's true that the Mossad had its tentacles so deep that they were able to plant bombs in this place where Hanie stayed. And that on its face seems dumb because how would you know which room the guy was going to be in or if he was even going to be there at all? Uh, the Iranians are saying, no, this was in fact a missile. The Israelis are saying, no, it was in fact a bomb. So somebody's lying, clearly. Uh, if it was in fact a bomb, that means that there's sleeper agents, there's moles, within the, the IRGC, perhaps, or one of these axes of uh, one of the, the elements of the axis of resistance, or within the Iranian government themselves. And perhaps that's even more embarrassing or, or the cause of more consternation amongst the Iranians uh, than a missile. But of course, both are embarrassing because, you know, I mean, was this a special ops thing? Did they fly the guys in on the the, uh, what do you call it, the cable that comes off the plane, like you see in the movies, and in the middle of the night, launch a rocket into this thing. I mean, was that the kind of thing we're talking about here? And just for this guy to do it there? Like, I mean, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The, the whole thing kind of stinks, honestly. Anyways, uh, Sweden is moving its embassy from Beirut. So once again, uh, that travel advisory, I think it's here to stay. That green square has become totally red. This is the U.S. State Department's travel advisory map, in case you didn't know it. So basically, this is a great look at, you know, how World War III is going to look. Uh, of course, China will become red. Oh, I'm standing in front of it at some point. Anything in red is basically the bad guys, right? Because we're the good guys. We never do anything wrong except, you know, print a lot of money and be the only country to ever drop a nuclear weapon. But hey, I mean, besides that, we're the good guys. Um, there's riots in the UK over the, uh, the immigrant guy who killed the little girls, stabbed them up, and uh, people are pissed off. And, you know, I mean, this is not to say that school shootings don't happen. It's not domestically grown. It happens all the time. In fact, the majority of those incidents are... Uh, people who are native to whatever country uh, you're talking about. But 
People are pissed off about this and it's just one more thing that is dividing us politically along the, the lines of immigration, identity politics, and uh, it's only going to get worse and worse as the economic contraction continues. And I think that's probably something that the power elite are going to use to their advantage when this shitstorm starts. Because remember, if they have people fighting or fighting with the riot police, then they can just impose even more restrictions on uh, freedom to travel and uh, things of that nature and, and restrict your civil liberties even more, which will benefit them during wartime. And looking at the markets, I'm still of the belief, I'm clinging to my theory, that the reason why we are seeing oil tank is not just because we're heading into an obvious economic recession, possible depression, but it's because whatever is coming, the global crisis is going to be so catastrophic. We are going to see lockdowns of the militaristic sort that is going to bring conspicuous consumption to a halt. And as such, you don't need as much oil if you're just powering the war machine. Yes, the war machine requires a lot of diesel <clears throat> and a lot of uh, energy, but not as much as, you know, the frivolous people who just want to go out and buy shit they don't need and get in a lot of debt doing it. So that's what we're seeing here. Gold is holding. The VIX is skyrocketing over that 20 uh, threshold. And when it's over 20, that means things are going crazy. In fact, it was all the way up to like 27, 28 today at one point. So it was up like 50%, which was insane. The NASDAQ down 10% in the past couple months. I mean, you could see that coming from a mile away and the US dollar is down. So to add insult to injury, the US dollar is down. Typically gold goes up, the US dollar goes down accordingly, but it's even doubly bad because uh, the dollars that it's measured in are worth less and less. What else do we got? Okay, so this is the uh, joint resolution to authorize the use of the United States Armed Forces to fight against the Islamic Republic of Iran for threatening the national security of the United States through the development of nuclear weapons. Talked about this last year. I mean, this is why I made the prediction that they're going to go to war with Iran. They're setting it all up. It's written in the stars at this point in time. They'll pass it. They will. They absolutely will because there's no resistance to it. So this is uh, the commander of the Iranian forces, I believe, Iranian army commander, saying that if the United States intervene this time, we will target its military bases and interests within the region. It's a done deal. What else is new? Excuse me. So this was House Resolution 559. This was uh, proposed last year, last November. And I believe it was agreed to. This is Yemen. And <laughs> look at these crowds. I've never seen crowds like this. And this is just a Tuesday in Yemen. Okay, this isn't even any... Yeah, they're, they're mourning the death of Han Haniye, uh, the, the leader of Hamas. But, I mean, you see this in Yemen all the time. These guys are ready for war. And they're the, the one country... I would say that has to their own detriment supported the plight of the Palestinians pretty much at every turn. And look at the size of that crowd. That is something else. And these are just people. Remember, this is not, these aren't people who are coming out to protest something or because they want something from their government. See, this is the difference. Whether you agree with these guys or not, these guys are coming out strictly to sacrifice themselves for their cause. Okay, could you ever imagine a situation where you had that many people in the streets? I mean, this almost looks AI generated. I know I'm gonna, you know, I just gave fuel to the conspiracy theorists, but you cannot see the end of that. Like it just goes on for miles. You can't really see it on here, but, or on your screen, but it just goes on for miles and it's just a sea of, people like look at that that is absolutely insane you can see it a bit more there i don't think i've ever seen so many people on a street that is mind-blowing 
So that's what they're up against. They're up against people who are willing to sacrifice themselves entirely because they think they're going to achieve martyrdom. You think you're going to beat that even with nuclear weapons? Forget about it. How can you beat somebody with nuclear weapons who views it as a privilege to ride into Valhalla like they do in Mad Max when they get witnessed? Now, here's what the Russians are doing. They dropped a banger today of a propaganda video. And this is how you know, we're going to take it to Russia now, this is how you know Russia is not pissing around anymore. You release a video like this a year and a half ago. Okay, you don't release a video like this when you are claiming, or at least the Iranians are claiming, or the Iranians always getting Iran and Ukraine mixed up just because the Ian part, the last, the suffix. So, anyways, you don't release a video like this when you think things are going to start going well. Uh, you, recrease, you release a recruiting video like this when you're getting ready to fight a world war. So this is a powerful video. It shows people from, I believe, three or four different faiths, uh, Muslim, Christian, uh, possibly Jewish, possibly Buddhist, I don't know. But it's showing them all in the context of battle and basically celebrating their, their, uh, you know, their, their heritage and all that stuff and uh, getting ready for World War III. And, you know, say what you will about the Russian media. They're not the greatest in terms of their ability to, like, they're usually their propaganda game is pretty weak. But in terms of their recruitment with this whole Z thing, like, you really need something like that in order to, and, and because now it's become so ingrained in the psyche. And that's what I said two years ago when I first seen this this whole Z campaign, I was like, that's genius because it's just basic psychology. You know, you, you put it in people's minds. It could have all different types of meanings, but it's a simple symbol that represents it. Of course, we've seen that throughout history. Unfortunately, it's manifested in very evil ways in the past. But unless we do something like that here in the West, unless you can get people to rally around some symbol of some ideological purpose, whatever that might be, uh, there's no way you can mobilize on the level that the Russians are right now. According to the Russians, they've wiped out three Patriot missile launchers in a day, as well as 570 Ukrainian casualties. Again, I don't have any evidence to, you know, to take it with a grain of salt. It's Russian media. Not three systems, but three launchers. They claim that Ukraine lost 60,000 troops in July. And the Russians have been making gains in the past week. I believe they have reacquired 57 square miles of territory, which isn't a lot. But, you know, at the pace of fighting that we're currently seeing, it is a lot. However, the Ukrainians continue to strike behind enemy lines. They are taking the fight to Russian critical infrastructure, as they typically do targeting oil refineries on a daily basis, as well as, according to the Russians, a civilian apartment complexes. And I won't show you that one because I don't want the video to get flagged, but uh, that's what's going on there. <clears throat> They're going to be blocking Google and Android. This is huge, okay? So Russia is potentially about to go dark. They're about to completely decouple. And again, why would you do this? Why would you release such a provocative uh, advertisement for recruitment if you thought that everything was quiet on the Eastern Front? You wouldn't because things are ramping up. So Russia is going to be blocking Google, iOS, and Android, okay, which of course is a uh, subsidiary of Google, I believe. Yeah, Google owns Android, right? Anyways, Alexei Didenko, a member of the Russian State Duma, has said that Google, including its Android operating system and Apple iOS, will soon be blocked in Russia. He advised the public not to cling to services like YouTube, stating soon Google will be blocked. This is crazy, okay, because, I mean, this is something you would have expected to see two years ago. This is a sign that we're entering into a very dark phase 
of this world when you have that disconnect happen. Because now it's going to start to go dark. It's going to be a new digital iron curtain of sorts. And all of this is happening while the Russians are in the third stage of their nuclear, tactical nuclear weapons exercises, which of course is all coinciding with the introduction of the F-16s, which are now there. They're there, officially. Did you hear about that in the media? Probably not. But the F-16s are now there. They're operating. They're running defensive missions. But I think... It's a little bit worse than that. Now, in terms of what's going on on the Polish front, props to my Polish source, who's always providing excellent information. And uh, we should probably talk about this. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> this district here, I'm probably mispronouncing it. Be Bialystok? Be Bialystok? Bialystok? Next to Belarus, this region. I'm not sure what they call them there, Oblast. The operational command of the Polish Armed Forces has provided information that the Unifil Peacekeeping Forces stationed in Lebanon, okay, that's with respect to Lebanon, I'll come back to that. This is important. As of August, Operation Safe Podlashi region, which lies along the Belarusian border, so somewhere in here, with the original 17,000 troops moved to this area, divided into 8,000 spread out directly along the border, and another 9,000 stationed in bases to be moved a short notice to wherever is needed. But what is interesting about this deployment, among the other deployments that are happening around Poland and Kaliningrad, is that the commanding general has been given the single-handed decision-making powers as to the use of those forces, which has never happened during peacetime, they claim, with this decision reserved to the civilian government in normal times. He has also been tasked with preparing everything for the long stay of major troop numbers in eastern Poland. So this is just the tip of the spear that is currently forming there. So that is on the Belarusian and Polish border interesting developments i think we can call it a video have i touched on everything i need to touch on i feel like i'm missing a lot of stuff let's just flip through the pages here and see what we missed oh yes check out the arrogance of this one the u.s department of state remember that whole january 6th thing well Anthony Blinken has not recognized the results of Venezuela's election. And again, not a Maduro fan. I think that, you know, he probably is a dictator to a certain degree. But again, we shouldn't be meddling in other countries' affairs. We should be letting them figure it out. And uh, this recognition of the, the, the person who lost the election, at least according to the current government, you know, this is just basically admitting that you are trying to do a coup in Venezuela, which of course they have admitted in the past. So nothing really new under the sun there, but I just thought that uh, this officiation of it in this U.S. State Department letter is quite telling. It means that they have a lot of unfinished business that they're about to embark on there as well. Nigeria is also in shambles, okay? So they're dealing with their own crisis, socioeconomic crises. This is a massive country in Africa. If you didn't know, probably, what, approaching 200 million people now. It's supposed to be one of the most populous countries on Earth. Sometime this century, surpassing even India, I do believe. So that is not good. Uh, yeah, so right now, unemployment numbers, uh, people unemployed for 15 weeks or over, one of the primary predictors of uh, recessions appears to be ticking upwards once again. And of course, when you have unemployment people with the cost of living so high, that's when you're going to see more stuff like this, a sea of red. What else we got going on here? Uh, there's going to be this robot that gets released by OpenAI, the company that makes ChatGPT4. Isn't that reassuring to know the company with the most advanced AI in the world is about to release this robot? 
and uh, they didn't really show any functionality of the robot. They say it's made in California. Okay, maybe this is how the United States is going to bring manufacturing back by bringing in robots that are going to automate everything. So they give you some clues here. Got an opposing thumb. It looks a lot like the uh, Tesla Optimus robot. But I tell you, man, oh boy, we're, we are, we're in for a wild ride in this life. Just hang in there, guys. Hang in there. This is in, I don't want to show that because anytime you show riot footage, it triggers something in the algorithm and then they downrank you. This is Intel. <clears throat> so it's unfortunate that the company that manufactures chips in the United States is down 55% year to date. But the company that is based in Taiwan, where of course there's going to be a war soon, is up what, like a thousand percent or something stupid like that? So, I mean, this is just a sign of the irrationality of the markets. I mean, this is the economic version of Hulk Hogan tearing off his shirt at the RNC or Megan the Stallion singing body at uh, Kamala Harris's talk that she gave. You know, I mean, this is the equivalent. This is just stupid because if any company you should be supporting, it's the company that's producing chips domestically, you would think, and that does have a PE ratio that shows it trading at a, a very uh, modest price. So it's, it's really modestly priced. I mean, I think it's trading below like 20 uh, for uh, earnings ratio. So, I mean, compared to NVIDIA, which is who knows how much, you know, for the PA ratio that company is trading at. But what that means is that it's very undervalued in a lot of ways. The only reason why it's down 55% is because they're, they're canning 15,000 people. And if you ask me, they're probably canning 15,000 people because they found ways to automate the process. And, you know, let's face it, it's business. Why would you want to pay 15,000 people if you didn't need to? Okay, so... But there's a lot of other political controversy uh, with respect to that because it, apparently they were beneficiaries of the of some uh, chip act or something that was put in place. This is the Pentagon uh, Domino's Pizza in Washington. So apparently this is a sign. This is an indicator that uh, right now they are. <coughs> excuse me. They're busy, okay? They're busy there. They're ordering a lot of pizza and they're staying up really late trying to figure out how they're going to start World War III in the Middle East. I mean, prevent, prevent war. Yeah, that's it. Uh, according to, I think this is in the UK, they've bumped up their H5N1 risk assessment to a level four, which means sustained and or multi-species mammalian outbreaks, increasing human zoonotic diseases or limited person-to-person -person spread, including to zoonotic exposures. At least five months of sustained transmission in cattle in the US with additional mammalian species affected an onward transmission to poultry, Transmission may relate to farming practices, but there are widespread standard practices, regularly identified human zoonotic infections, although rate cannot be assessed. No person-to-person -person transmission demonstrated. However, as I talked about two months ago, there was a case where there was no known contact with anybody who was infected, and we kind of just forgot about that. Now, a lot of the cases that I've been presenting have been quite mild in uh, their symptoms, so I'm wondering if they're just kind of waiting until this spreads to bust out uh, lockdown 2.0. This just got me thinking, 600 pound transformer on the way to Wolf Creek. Now, if there was ever an electromagnetic pulse event, like a high altitude nuclear event, you would have to get these things. These are massive transformers, okay, 600,000 pounds. Apparently this thing has to move at five miles an hour because it's on this, what looks like a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I don't know, like 20 axle truck or whatever. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, could you imagine having to do this through the wasteland, through a war zone, trying to rebuild how long it would take? I mean, just the, just the delivery of it, much less getting the parts from China, which of course would never happen in those circumstances. So guys, the shizzy is hitting the fizzy. You better be preparing 
Go check out CanadianPreparedness.com. We got everything from bulletproof, military helmets, everything. The highest quality preparedness food, weaponry, you name it, we got it. All things emergency preparedness, CanadianPreparedness.com. Not sure if you can see that. We're getting t-shirts in very soon as well. So stay tuned because, you know, the show must go on. Until the bitter end, I got work to do on the homestead, so I got to bounce. I hope you guys have a good weekend, but I'm sure the rate of the news, I'm going to see you before, before Sunday. Take care.